Boris Johnson meets his cabinet over his decision not to impose further COVID restrictions in England, despite high levels of infection. It comes as health chiefs say the need for confirmatory PCR tests in England for people who don't have symptoms will be dropped. They're really accurate in when you've got a very infectious variant like Omicron. So actually what we do all the time is look at what makes sense. In Scotland, the government considers a reduction in the time people have to isolate from 10 to 7 days. And in France, President Macron causes uproar by using strong language about how he'd like to deal with the unvaccinated. Also this lunchtime. In Kazakhstan, a wave of protests over rising fuel prices. Police use tear gas and stun grenades. There are 200 arrests and dozens injured. Outrage in Australia as world number one Novak Djokovic gets a medical exemption to compete at the Tennis Open without needing proof of a Covid vaccine. And a 32-year-old British Army officer, Preet Chadney, has become the first woman of colour to complete a solo expedition to the South Pole. And in sport on the BBC News Channel, England's bowlers have delivered on the opening day of the fourth Ashes Test. Two late wickets have given them hope as Australia closed on 126 for three. Good afternoon and welcome to the BBC News at One. The Prime Minister has been meeting his cabinet to discuss his decision not to impose further COVID restrictions in England, despite surging cases due to the Omicron variant. Health officials have confirmed this lunchtime that the rules will be changed so that people in England who test positive for COVID with a lateral flow device, but who don't have symptoms, will no longer be asked to take a follow-up PCR test. Boris Johnson has said that he hoped the country could ride out the Omicron wave, despite the UK recording a record number of positive daily cases yesterday. Here's our political correspondent, Jonathan Blake. The health secretary arrived in Downing Street this morning as ministers met to review the decision to keep current measures in place in England and go no further for now. Yesterday, the Prime Minister warned there were difficult weeks ahead, but said England could ride out the wave of Omicron cases without new restrictions. I would say we have a good chance of getting through uh, the Omicron wave uh, without the need for, uh, for further restrictions and without the need, certainly, for a lockdown. Over Christmas, confidence has increased in government that England can cope with Omicron without the need for further measures. But while that has eased political pressure on Boris Johnson from his own backbenchers, many of whom are deeply opposed to tighter restrictions, it's not without risk and comes at a cost of increased pressure on the NHS. Rising cases and staff shortages are increasing the strain. Hospitals in Greater Manchester are stopping some non-urgent surgery. Around 15% of the workforce there have COVID or are isolating. From pausing procedures to critical incidents, several hospital trusts in England and one in Wales have now taken steps to cope with the pressure. If you've been waiting for a hip operation or something along those lines, it, you're going to be delayed in that. And that doesn't feel like a minor issue for those people. So we will see uh, some additional challenges for people uh, facing further delays. And that then adds to the, the ongoing issue around backlog of cases in the system. In a move which could improve the availability of tests, people who get a positive lateral flow result will soon not need a follow-up PCR test, but will still have to isolate. What we've got actually is many, many more lateral flow tests and they're really accurate in when you've got a very infectious variant like Omicron. So actually what we do all the time is look at what makes sense. We don't need to do things that are unnecessary. Amid changes to guidance, booster jabs are still the main hope to limit serious illness among older people. A key test of the government's approach. At Westminster this afternoon, Labour's deputy leader Angela Rayner will face Boris Johnson at Prime Minister's questions. <laughs> Sakia Starmer is isolating, having tested positive for coronavirus for a second time. Jonathan Blake, BBC News.
Hugh Pym is with me, our health editor. Hugh, this change in the rules that health chiefs are talking about, about um, not needing PCR tests if you are asymptomatic, what's the thinking behind that? Well, Rita, the current rules are that if you are asymptomatic but you test positive on your lateral flow test, you've just done a check and you find out that, you, that you've tested positive, that you do a follow-up PCR. Now, that is now going to be suspended from January the 11th in England by the UK Health Security Agency in charge of test and trace. The devolved administrations may well be applying it sooner. And the logic is when you have very high prevalence out there, the lateral flow test is pretty good at picking up people who are asymptomatic but who could be spreading the virus. So there's no point having that confirmatory PCR test. And in fact, this did happen in the early months of last year when there was also very high prevalence. So the requirement will simply be if you test positive, you should start your self-isolation straight away. If you have symptoms, you should, as now, continue doing a PCR test. Uh, and it's not clear how long this temporary suspension will last, but it seems clear that while the infection rate generally is pretty high, that that will be the case. And it does make things a bit more convenient for people who test positive and then have to wait a while for a PCR before they can start their self-isolation. OK, Hugh, many thanks. Hugh Pym there. Rules requiring travellers to take a test before they arrive in England could soon be scrapped as the government reviews its coronavirus travel restrictions. The travel industry says that compulsory testing for UK arrivals and departures has held back the sector's recovery. Well, our transport correspondent Katie Austin is at St Pancras International Station in London for us now. And uh, Katie, this is an industry that's really suffered. Yeah, that's right. I mean, after the Omicron variant emerged in late November, uh, the UK government introduced fresh travel restrictions to try and slow its uh, entry and spread in the UK. Uh, so at the moment, travellers uh, have to show evidence of a negative COVID test taken within two days of setting off to come to the UK. And then after they arrive, uh, they have to pay to have a PCR test uh, within two days as well. Now, the travel industry says these rules have really hit demand at a time when confidence was just recovering uh, and they say this isn't just about immediate plans being changed but also this time of year is normally a really big time for summer holiday bookings being made and travel agents I've spoken to say bookings really have been much lower than what they would have hoped for. It's widely expected uh, that the pre-departure test element will be dropped as part of a review of the rules uh, happening today. There are many in the travel industry who would like the government to go much further and get rid of both testing requirements because they would argue that now Omicron is so widely spread both within the UK and around the world, these measures just aren't effective anymore. But whatever the UK government does decide to do uh, when it makes that decision this afternoon, a lot of other countries still have travel restrictions in place, including in some cases some pretty strict entry requirements. Katie, thanks. Katie Austin reporting there. Well, Scotland's First Minister Nicola Sturgeon will update the Scottish Parliament this afternoon as Covid case numbers continue to rise sharply. Latest figures show a seven-day average of more than 16,000 cases in Scotland. The highest daily figure since the pandemic began was recorded on Monday. Our Scotland correspondent Alexandra McKenzie has more. A new term, overshadowed by a new coronavirus variant. Some schools in Scotland return today, others go back later this week. With record Covid case numbers, the impact on education is uncertain. I thought they would put another lockdown on school. I did think that um, and I was hoping that was going to happen. I'm nervous because there's a ton of Covid going around. I'm more concerned about the, the teachers' welfare, you know, because I had COVID recently myself and it's, it takes a lot out of you. I actually feel OK about it um, because we've had um, coronavirus a few months ago so I kind of think that it's a, lesser, it's a less serious strain and if we get it, we get it. Hospitality struggled over the festive season. Many businesses now face staff shortages due to people with the virus and their close contacts having to isolate. There is increasing pressure on the First Minister to reduce the isolation period from 10 to 7 days with negative tests. 
from the beginning of sort of December there being one or two sort of each week to now it's sort of half a dozen a week type sort of thing and you just you try and manage the situation on a day to day basis. In recent days there's been a dramatic increase in the number of daily cases of coronavirus in Scotland with more than 20,000 on Monday. There's also been a rise in the number of people in hospital and that is expected to continue. They will increase because there are uh, huge numbers of people who have been infected and even if only a small proportion of those um, become so seriously symptomatic, um, it's still going to increase uh, the, the numbers in hospital quite substantially. This is not the start to 2022 that anyone would have wanted. But for now, coronavirus continues to disrupt many aspects of our everyday lives. Alexandra McKenzie, BBC News, Glasgow. Schools are due to reopen in Wales tomorrow following the holiday break, but some have suggested they'll delay opening until Monday due to staff shortages. In Northern Ireland, vulnerable primary school children are expected to be offered a low-dose COVID-19 vaccine in the coming weeks, in line with the rest of the UK. Last month, the government's vaccine advisers said 5 to 11-year-olds with an underlying health condition or who live with someone who is immunosuppressed should receive two doses eight weeks apart. A decision on vaccinating all children in this age range hasn't yet been made. And with pressure on hospitals growing, the BBC has launched a special NHS tracker, which will let you find out how your local services are coping. The tracker will run throughout winter and will show you the latest data on waiting times for emergency treatment where you live. Well, across Europe, governments are struggling to contain the rising number of cases of the Omicron variant. In France, President Macron has used controversial language to say he wants to make life more difficult for people who haven't been vaccinated. Italy's government will also meet later to decide whether to approve tougher measures. Our correspondent Mark Lowen has been looking at the situation across Europe. A new year surge and new political tensions over tackling it. In France, currently with Europe's highest cases, a parliament debate about vaccine passes for restaurants and trains was suspended after an interview by President Macron that prompted howls of outrage. He told Le Parisien newspaper he wanted to bar the unvaccinated from social activities, using the slang word emmerder, aiming to piss them off. It's deepened France's already fractious discussion, the government's plans to bring in the law by mid-January thrown into doubt. A president of the republic cannot say the sorts of things that have been said. We will not continue to debate a bill that you describe as protecting French people when we learn from the press that it's a bill intended to piss off a part of the population. Despite more than 270,000 cases yesterday, France is using vaccines, not lockdowns, to combat it, a picture that's repeated across much of Europe. Here in Italy, the push is to vaccinate the over fives as schools prepare to resume, arming the youngest in the battle against the pandemic. We are doing a job that's about uh, society and that we all have to contribute to make others feel safe. So. It's a teamwork. The first country in the West to fall to coronavirus in 2020 became the first in the world to lock down nationwide back then. But today, even with record cases, Italy's streets are once again busy, as it too tightens vaccine rules instead. The cabinet today debating compulsory shots for all workers. Greece is also seeing soaring infections, leading to round-the-block queues for tests. The Prime Minister announcing all over 60s will be fined unless they get the vaccine. Across the continent, countries are moving towards living with Covid. But that means carrots and sticks to get the holdouts jabbed. Mark Lowen, BBC News, Rome. The time is just coming up to a quarter past one, our top story this lunchtime. Health chiefs say they'll drop the need for people in England to have confirmatory PCR tests if they don't have coronavirus symptoms. And coming up, how pressures on the social care system are making it harder for disabled adults to live independent lives. 
in sport on the BBC News Channel. The Australian government has warned Novak Djokovic may not be allowed to enter the country to defend his Australian Open title, despite tournament organisers granting him a medical exemption from having a COVID vaccination. This year marks the 40th anniversary of the Falklands conflict, which claimed the lives of 255 British and 649 Argentinian troops. The conflict, which lasted 10 weeks, was triggered when Argentina invaded and occupied the Falkland Islands, followed by the invasion of neighbouring South Georgia. Our defence correspondent Jonathan Beale has been looking back at the events of 1982 and speaking with some of the veterans who fought in it. It was a war on the other side of the world. On April the 2nd, 1982, Argentine forces invaded the Falkland Islands and claimed it as their own. The task force, with all its power, is ready. Britain has gathered its might. It must set its course. Accompanied by the late Brian Hanrahan for the BBC, a task force of more than 100 ships had set sail within days to make the 8,000 mile journey to liberate the islands. I thought we'd better get ready and take it seriously, but I'm not quite sure that I absolutely believe we'd do it. But as they sail south, resolve hardened. First, with the controversial sinking of the Argentine cruiser, the General Belgrano, with the loss of 323 lives. It would be the largest air and sea battle involving British forces since the Second World War. A hundred aircraft and more than 20 ships would either be destroyed or damaged. Julian Thompson was the man charged with the initial British landings at San Carlos on the 21st of May. Luckily, it was thick fog, so the Argentine Air Force never found us. We knew they were trying to find us. We could hear them zooming around and uh, trying to find us. They might have created a bit of mayhem had they done so. That was a bit I was really worried about. Goose Green was the first time British paratroopers came face to face with the enemy. The British lost 18 men, among them friends of Paul Bishop, who was just 21. After we took casualties and, and friends had been killed, there was, in my, you know, my feelings was, was hate towards them, you know. We, you know, we wanted to take out as many as we could. We wanted to remove them from the islands. Later, Paul witnessed this, the Argentine attacks at Bluff Cove, where the British lost more than 50 men. We're now between the two gun lines, and there's a right old artillery duel going on between them. The battle on the ground took just over a month. On the 14th of June, the Argentines surrendered. 649 of them lost their lives. The British had lost 255 men. So what will the 40th anniversary mean for these veterans? I personally don't expect anything from, from the country, from the government. You know, we, we just volunteered to do it and we did it. It'd be nice to be remembered. I visit the St. Carlos Cemetery and um, usually shed a tear there. Uh, and look out over that peaceful water and remember what it was like with guns firing and ships being hit and aeroplanes bombing. And those contrast is really quite remarkable. 40 years on from a war on the other side of the world, but they are still remembered. Jonathan Beale, BBC News. The president of Kazakhstan has declared a two-week state of emergency in parts of the country following protests over fuel price rises which turned violent. On Tuesday, the president dismissed the government and said lower fuel prices would be restored. But in the country's main city, Almaty, hundreds of anti-government protesters stormed the mayor's office and police used tear gas to disperse crowds after vehicles were set on fire. Well, our Central Asia correspondent Rehan Dimitri is in Tbilisi in Georgia for us. And Rehan, just bring us up to date with the latest. Well, Rita, this is an unprecedented scale of protest that swept across Kazakhstan, a vast country the size of Western Europe. Uh, it began on January the 2nd when uh, uh, in Western Kazakhstan, oil workers came out to protest after the government decided to remove a price cap on liquefied natural gas, the LNG, 
Many people in Kazakhstan have converted their cars to run on LNG. Uh, the internet has now been completely shut down across Kazakhstan. But earlier on Wednesday, some people have managed to publish uh, uh, footage uh, 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 using the virtual private networks. And it showed government buildings on fire and also quite heavy handed response from the law enforces. It now is clear, it is now clear that uh, this uh, protest is about deep and long running frustrations among uh, general uh, uh, Kazakh population because Kazakhstan is a country rich in oil and gas, but that wealth doesn't trickle down to the general population. And one of the common chants that we've heard across the country was Shalket which translates from Kazakh as old man leave. And that is the reference to the country's first president, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev. He now holds the title, the leader of the nation, and the capital of Kazakhstan was renamed after him. He has been accused and his family of amassing great wealth. Uh, and, and that asset includes some uh, very expensive property in central London. Rehan, thank you. That's Rehan Dimitri reporting there. A memorial to the 22 people murdered in the Manchester Arena terror attack has opened to the public. The white marble halo, called the Glade of Light, bears the names of those who died in the bombing in May 2017. Relatives of the victims made memory capsules containing mementos and messages to be embedded inside. Just under half the budget for social care is spent on supporting disabled adults of working age. But the system is under pressure, with increasing demand for services, services combined with a shortage of carers. It means that some people are not getting the support they need to live independent lives, in some cases facing bedtimes much earlier than they would like. Paul Carter reports. Oh, thank you. Suzanne likes to go out. And then we can party the whole night through. Yes. The most change. But an evening trip to the pub with her partner Jason is a rare occasion. Drink? Mm hmm. Realistically, if we were going out for a meal or a drink, we'd probably have to leave by about 6 30 to make sure we were home in time. Her disability means that she needs help getting into bed. She has an evening call from a care agency, but the time of this can sometimes be unpredictable and can be as early as 7 30. Going to bed at 7.30 is just way too early for me personally. You know, I'm only in my mid-40s and unless you're absolutely exhausted, who goes to bed at 7.30 at night? It really does seem like a loss of control. You are completely at the mercy of the situation you're in with the carers. Hi, Stella, are you all right? I'm OK, where you are you? Jennifer also needs help in the morning and evening. That often means long shifts for her carers, like Stella. Ready? Ready? Go. Normally I start at 7.30, I have to leave early, finish it, he depends. If I have to come to Jennifer, I finish like 8.30. You two see you in the morning. the morning. There must be times where it's half past seven in the evening and you think, oh, I just don't want to go to bed right now. It's difficult, but I don't want my carers then going to bed at midnight because they're coming here at you know, 11 to help me to bed. They're doing this, these long days and I'd like to see them doing a shift system. The agency that provides Jennifer's care says that the way the funding of the current system is structured limits the shifts they can provide. It will be possible if the contract that we have with the authorities, NHS or social services or private plan, allow you to give an extra uh, allowance for those who want a late call. Is it basically just it needs more money. It is money, yes, yes. Hello, gorgeous. With the care industry facing multiple challenges around staffing and funding, the government have recently announced an additional £5.4 billion of funding for social care over the next three years. Good girl. Suzanne's hope is that if some of those pressures are relieved, she'll be able to extend her days out to more nights out. OK. Paul Carter, BBC News. Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison has said the tennis player Novak Djokovic, who's world number one, must prove he has a genuine medical exemption from having a COVID vaccine. If not, when he lands in the country to defend his Australia Open title, he'll be on the next plane home. Djokovic has not revealed why the medical exemption was granted. Our sports correspondent Natalie Perks has more. A kiss for luck. And if the response from the Australian public is anything to go by, he's going to need it. 
Reigning champion Novak Djokovic has never revealed his vaccination status, but has been granted exemption permission to play in Melbourne. That means he has valid medical reasons for not being vaccinated, but he'll still need to prove it. We await his presentation and what evidence he provides to support that. If that evidence is insufficient, then he won't be treated any different to anyone else and he'll be on the next plane home. So uh, there should be no special rules for Novak Djokovic at all, not, none whatsoever. A handful of other players were granted exemptions too. Reasons could be cardiac illness or Djokovic could have recently tested positive for the virus. But Melbourne residents have experienced some of the toughest COVID restrictions in the world. And it looks like that famous Aussie welcome won't be forthcoming. He shouldn't be allowed to come. It's his choice not to be vaccinated, which is fine. And it's I think the government here has made the choice that, you know, you should be vaccinated. I guess he might even get booed when he gets up onto the court. We have someone that's come from overseas and all of a sudden he's he's been exempt and can play. And I think it's an absolute disgrace and I won't be watching it. Organisers say Djokovic's medical exemption was granted after a rigorous review process involving two separate independent panels of medical experts and they've denied special treatment. Novak isn't coming to play at the Australian Open because he's you know, the biggest tennis star of them all. Um, he's coming because he has been able to demonstrate um, through this process um, that he has, an, you know, he has an eligibility under the rules that apply to everybody else in the country. Djokovic has a great reason for wanting to play in Melbourne. He could move clear of Rafa Nadal and Roger Federer, with the three of them currently tied on 20 Grand Slams each. Right now, though, tennis fans are in no mood to play ball. Natalie Perks, BBC News. At the close of the opening day of the fourth Ashes Test in Sydney, Australia were 126 for three in their first innings. Play was disrupted by rain, as Joe Wilson reports. So what's left to play for in the Ashes? Well, every ball counts, doesn't it? That was David Warner's idea. England had James Anderson and Stuart Broad bowling. No early joy for either. And that is going to be four. Marcus Harris with that shot. How soon do you start worrying if you're England's captain? Well, perhaps he never stops. But Broad's an expert at dismissing David Warner. Remember? There. Gone! Got him! Good catch. Gone for 30. Now that's why I should play every match. Broad may just have been thinking. Watch now. Some courageous commitment. Frantic pace. Gripping drama. Here we go. Stumps clear. Covers on. Yeah, the ground staff were busy. Rain lingered over Sydney. Eventually the cricket resumed. Manus Labuschagne scoring runs. Frustrating England. Normal service. Harris on 38. Anderson at 39. Edged. Taken. A timely wicket for England. A reminder. They can compete. Here comes Mark Wood. There goes Labuschagne. Well, he's got him. Edged. Caught. 126 for three at the close of play and a chance to show England enjoying the Ashes? Well, for once, why not? Joe Wilson, BBC News. A 32-year-old army officer has become the first woman of colour to complete a solo expedition to the South Pole. Captain Preet Chadney tre trekked 700 miles in 40 days, pulling her equipment in a sledge. She faced temperatures of minus 45 Celsius and said she wanted to encourage people to push boundaries and to believe in themselves. Our correspondent Phil Mackey has the story. This was the moment she made it, 40 days after Captain Preet Chandy set off and two years after she started training. I made it to the South Pole where it's snowing, feeling so many emotions right now. I knew nothing about the polar world three years ago and it feels so surreal to finally be here. Getting ready wasn't exactly easy. She went to Iceland and spent 27 days in Greenland to prepare for the extreme conditions. Before she left, Polar Preet, as she's become known, who's an army physio, said one of the reasons she wanted to do it was to inspire other girls from her background. As a woman of colour, as an Asian woman, you know, when people see me doing this, again, the image, you know, they don't expect to see that they're, they're so excited. And it's just, you know, people have said to me that I'm, I'm such a, a role model just for them to see somebody that looks, uh, you know, slightly like them. During the trek, she had to tackle 60 mile an hour winds while pulling a 90 kilogram sled in temperatures that fell as low as minus 50 degrees Celsius. 
As she got closer, she suffered from exhaustion, but that all melted away with the elation of achieving her goal. You are capable of anything you want, no matter where you are from, where your start line is. Everybody starts somewhere. I don't want to just break the glass ceiling. I want to smash it into a million pieces. Who's with me? And an awful lot of people are. Her accomplishment is being seen as a triumph back at home. She's going to have to get used to being at the pole for a little longer. An outbreak of COVID means the flight crew that will bring her back is stuck in isolation. Phil Mackey, BBC News. What an achievement. Uh, time for a look at the weather. Here's Susan Powell. Not 45 degrees, minus 45 degrees Celsius here, but snow. No, Rita, not minus 45, but we might actually tonight get down to minus 10, which is quite exceptional. That could turn out to be our coldest night of this winter so far. And just like Rita said, there is some snow in our forecast as well. A very hard and widespread frost to come tonight. It will stay chilly for the next few days across the UK. And I think there is some significant snow to come, particularly through tomorrow. Uh, this is a gorgeous picture from our weather watcher in the Highlands this afternoon. The birds are very well fed here. We could be topping up with another 10 10 centimetres of snow across parts of the Highlands before Thursday is out. Just a few isolated snow showers though for northern Scotland this afternoon. Actually more sunshine for much of the UK than we have seen in quite a while out there at the moment. A few showers down the North Sea coasts. Those towards the west across Wales and Northern Ireland though dying out now. There is definitely a chill though with the northwesterly breeze but the breeze falls light through the evening. The skies are clear and then the temperatures will fall away. You'll notice a bit more cloud though pushing towards Northern Ireland and the wind starting to kick up here so by the end of the night perhaps just minus one here minus 10 though in some of the sheltered glens of Scotland minus five or minus six in some rural areas of England and Wales and then we have the problem of very cold air sitting across the UK and a weather front approaching put two and two together you get snow and that is what we'll be concerning ourselves with as we see these fronts working their way particularly across the northern half of the UK on Thursday. There's a little bit of warmer air mixed in with that system but it's quite a small area of warm air so essentially we won't see our temperatures kicking up too much before we transition back into colder conditions leaving us with the threat of quite a lot of snow accumulating across the highlands of Scotland, the southern uplands and the Pennines but also across lower ground as well. Wet further south, gusty winds as the weather front goes through we could have blizzard conditions in some areas for a time it gets brighter to the west later on in the day but still some showers being shuttled in but it's cold just three degrees there in Aberdeen and it will feel colder in the wind we continue with a chilly northwesterly wind into Friday, a frost to start the day across the northern half of the UK, a risk of ice, some more wintry showers for northern and western Scotland, for Northern Ireland, perhaps a few getting down into the Midlands. Still looking quite chilly for Friday as well. So I think a notable change for the beginning of the weekend as we look to the Atlantic and this frontal system because there's a larger chunk of warm air wrapped up in this one and that will bolster our temperatures for Saturday back into double figures but quite a grey and wet day and then some Sunday, perhaps our quietest and brightest day of the few ahead after the sunshine of today. Rita. Thank you very much, Susan. A reminder now of our top story. Health chiefs say they'll drop the need for people in England to have confirmatory PCR tests if they don't have coronavirus symptoms. Well, that's all from BBC News at once. So it's goodbye from me. And on BBC One, we now join the BBC's news teams where you are. Bye bye. <laughs>